So Kevin, Sam, and I said, um, we should really jam, make an ambient album. So we set up recording time in June, I picked a date, and um, that was it. That's all we did. So we had not really discussed what we were going to do ahead of time. We hadn't agreed on simple things like what key are we going to play in or what the tempo will be. In fact, the tempo was determined by the fact that I had used my Euro rig a couple nights before to just kind of experiment with it, and it was still at that same tempo. So the whole project's at 140 BPM because of that. So it's completely arbitrary. Um, I've known Sam since 2005 when he was a student here. Um, I've, I've played on one or two West things, I'm told. Yes. And uh, live you did too. Yeah, and, and live as well. But I haven't, you know, we haven't really played together before. I'd never played with Kevin. Um, I really didn't know what to expect. Um, and I was still setting up in the studio when Sam walks in and picks up his guitar. He, he set Pro Tools in motion and we were recording and while well, I'm still setting up. So um, the first thing you need to know about the album is it's completely live. And that everything you're going to hear was played by one of three people. Live. There were no overdubs at all on this project. Okay? Um, now, that doesn't mean you're going to hear everything that was played. Because we um, early on decided that we could do things like rebalance. And maybe even mute a couple licks to kind of help uh, create a sense of form in this. Because... Again, you're telling a story here, right? And so over the course of this 67 and a half minute performance, um, there's a lot of different sections. So to kind of really make those sections work, sometimes we'd fade out a pad or, you know, cut off the bass note early or not bring in the bass note until the beginning of the next section, that sort of thing, um, just to give it a little bit of uh, formal clarity, clarity in the form. Um, but pretty much everything is, is in there. Um, I can think of maybe two notes that got moved just because whether it was bass or me or whatever, somebody played something and the, it was clear what the intention was and they just played it late and it would be distracting to leave it in the wrong place. Um, but I think really probably less than five of those things. Um, I don't even remember the autocorrect, but I guess we did do that. Um, uh, and then it's just a matter of picking it apart. So let me uh, play for you just uh, about five minutes. Actually, we'll probably play about seven minutes of this into the first solo to just get a, a sense of what it sounded like on the day. So this is just running the tracks off at the end of the session. made very little attempt to mix. I mean, we probably raised or lowered the faders a little, but very the quickly, up. the day Oh, off. yeah, I mean. It's basically a board mix, yeah. like you would get off a live performance, right? And it's kind of interesting to me to hear it right now. First of all, it sounds very dull. It doesn't have any sense of depth, because there's no reverb on anything. Uh, except my rig has a few effects, and obviously you're using reverbs and other delays and things as well. And I know you said I, was, I want to reiterate that not a word was spoken about the notes and the music. We just kind of got in a room and just started playing. Right, so I'm playing this sequence. It's a 16-step sequence from the sequencer. It's randomly created, but I do get to constrain it, so I'm able to say how many octaves the melody spans, I'm able to decide which notes on the keyboard are available. So I, this happened to be built on an A minor triad with the addition of the note F. So, or you could think of it, I guess, as an F major seven, but we're playing an A minor and we have this flat six in there as well. This is kind of what it sounded like. Yeah. And so Kevin and I are, there was moments where we were throwing gestures at each other, like notes, right. uh, just, you know, but for the most part, it was kind of just made up. 
Um, yeah, and we're all listening to each other and yeah. trying to respond to what each other is doing. Um, one of my problems with this section is just really kind of loose rhythmically. It's like all new for Kevin and Sam to yeah. hear what I'm doing and to kind of lock to it. We're still getting headphone balances. Yeah. Um, you can at one point you could hear the door shutting of me coming in because right. you know I I like was you know twisting a guitar. My guitar was plugged in wrong for the first about ten minutes as well. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we fixed it. Um, and uh, yeah, we did not expect to like right. actually use sixty or so minutes hey, of, of music. I, I kind of assumed we would like find the best right. few minutes and make make separate pieces. But right. as this went on, I mean, we we started to really lock with each other, and um, so this section of it I call the primordial soup, and I'm mixing it very differently than what you're hearing now because I'm really thinking of it as the bass with a whole bunch of other textures. And so you won't even hear the sequencer going because it's so buried in that texture mix when we get to the final mix. Um, that's the piano. That's me playing piano. Right, so this is, see, I can lock the sequencer into a loop and then switch over to piano and play, and that's what I'm doing. And so I'm going back and forth between the piano. At one point, Sam plays piano. Um, but you can see it's kind of rhythmically loose. It's not quite gelling. I call this second piece um, looking for the one. And that's the literally what we're trying to do is figure out where's beat one and all be there at the same time. But uh, about five minutes in, you're gonna hear the second theme on piano. And from that point on, it starts to lock and we start to, to play better. Another technical thing with my sequencer is most of the time it's doing a 16 step sequence and we're at 140 and my clock is an eighth note clock so that means every two bars i'm repeating the sequence right so it's a it's a two bar sequence but i also have a switch which lets me change the sequence length so it could be one bar it could be a half a bar it could be three steps instead of 16. And so I'm able to mix and match, and sometimes that causes uh, things to shift. And uh, over the course of the piece, Sam and Kevin got very good at adding in an extra beat here or there yeah. to make us all lock together. Well, and the, the beauty of maybe where you're playing it yeah. on your synthesized, the Eurorack rig. Yeah. Hang on one sec. So this is where the, we start to lock. When he pointed like that, where we feel that pulse right. is what we're, we're talking about. We're all together at that moment. Right, and again, this is a, a crappy mix, but just, you hear the piano? That sounds like your grandmother's piano. I mean, it's not really a studio recording. Um, the piano is a little closer to us. Kevin is in the corner here. Sam is over there with his pedal board the the front of the piano is facing the bass and so we're getting some bass leakage in the piano mics and we're also getting maybe a little piano leakage um into the mic on the bass and also every time you know you hit your op1 or step on a pedal we yeah. get a click so there's definitely some noises in this performance that just kind of you know, became something to deal with, but also something that we ultimately left in. For the guitar heads, um, there was no guitar amp. I, I used a pedal guitar amp, so there's no leakage of the electric guitar, but the, you can hear the strings playing. Yep. I play synthesizers, as, uh, I trip up a certain point, you know, and there's, you could hear that in the piano mics. If we were to do this again, we may switch out how we would actually record it. Again, we didn't know we'd be using, you know, an hour's worth of material. Right. But that journey ended up being a really cool contrast and and completely improvised, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that's so. In some ways, it sort of has a jazz aesthetic, although you know, it's definitely definitely um, electronic as well. So a lot of sort of texture changes. Kevin's playing very high. You're doing less texture. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you know. That's a guitar. I mean, I try to make my guitar sound nothing like a guitar. Pipe um, organ, string section, yeah, check, yeah, yeah. guitar, no. Yeah, no guitar. There's a couple moments of guitar. And so here's the first solo on the bass. So the bass is the principal solo instrument. And he does two solos, pizzicato, where he's plucking, and two arco, bowing. And you can hear that the bass is kind of mellow and muffled, not a very good sound. And it's kind of conf being masked quite a bit by the keyboard, by the Eurorack. And Sam's got this OP1 synth doing this twinkly kind of synth pad, but no reverb, it's just all kind of there right now. All right, I think that's enough. What do you think? Yeah. So this is a, a section we call climbing the steps. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, we'll leave that open. I'm missing some files, probably mix files, I'm guessing. All right. You know, before I play this, um, let me just save it. We will um, stop this other thing. Jane, is that right, you know, uh, I think it was just Finder. Oh, it was Finder. Oh, yeah. OK, my bad. All right, so before I do this, I want to just take this, close it. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Save it. Um, as, I, as we mentioned, we have uh, we're up to mix Y, which means we had 24 mixes before that. Um, sorry, too many buttons. Putting that away. Um, let me go back. And, um, but I do want to go to one of the older mixes just to maybe look at the very first one. So, um, session is what I'm looking for. There it is, the session. And old sessions. Let's go to B. That'll work. Uh, by the way, the title, The Quest for Authenticity, ChatGPT. Brilliant. You use it for all your papers. We're going to use it to name That's songs. right, no. to name songs. Why'd you look at me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that Oh, so look at that. You should have used it for your papers. It's yeah. fine, yeah. Oh, you mean I could have used it for my paper? <laughs> um, well, let's just go here for a little bit. So this is very early in the process. And I gotta tell you, it took us, the, the, the final piece is 67 and a half minutes long, right? 67.32. Took just over an hour to record. I've easily put in 60 plus hours listening to this project and really thinking about how to produce it. So um, there's that. So, but early on, even by mix B, I'm starting to get some ideas for different sections and starting to break things down. and. At this point, they're just the obvious places. Um, but you can see if I zoom out a little. Thank you. Oh, who cares? It's all good. If I zoom out, um, or zoom up, you can see that you know most of the tracks have quite a bit of stuff. Now, we recorded the bass with a close mic. It was a Bach. The Bach. Um, the U87 yeah, clone, Yeah, the U87 clone, the 195, yep. Right, and then also we Cardioid. took a pickup from the bass. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever fooled around with acoustic bass, but often the pickup is great live because you have less feedback on stage, but the sound quality is not that great. Um, so let's just play a little bit of, say, section two. And I'm going to actually... That's what the pickup sounds like. now. Does this mix have any EQ at this point? It does, but I think it's bypassed, right? No. What are we checking with, with those two, with the mic and the DI? What are we going to check right away, too? Phase. Right. Good. Good. So that's bypassed. I'm not really doing a lot except getting rid of some of the obvious extra stuff. But yeah, I mean, that's not what acoustic bass sounds like. Acoustic bass sounds like this. Uh, 
The one gripe I have with this sound though is it's really round and big, which makes it great as a supportive instrument, but when it comes to solos, lacks a little bit of presence. You hear the piano faintly in the background? That's not so bad leakage. But as we EQ and compress, right? We're gonna, as you compress this, it's gonna bring up the room noise, right? Right. So anyway. Yeah. Please, any questions, go ahead and just shut them up. The piano's bleeding in the bass, it's still giving it like a, oh, like a very nice, it sounds like it fits with the bass, like even though it's leaking, which we don't want. Sure. It's still given that. Oh, well, and, and there's a piano track too, which is going to mask any leakage. And the bass is here and the piano's down here. So I'm not at all worried about the leakage. And I think what you're kind of getting at is there's a nice roominess to this, which is a good thing on the yeah. bass. Yeah, there was moments where we right. talked about that and said, let's embrace the fact that right. I want people to know and feel that this was three people just playing in a room live. Like I want right. to feel that, you know? And as I said, we left some things in that maybe, on a, you know, and a uh, smart person would never do, but we decided go for it. Um, now, just to give you a t some a taste of the other tracks. That's an electric guitar. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and, and in this part, it does sound kind of uh, guitar-like, but let's go to the intro just so you can we hear use a lot. We use a lot of pedals on the guitar. So, yeah. um, so I love this. If there's any guitar nerds, we can get in there and talk about which ones. But... That to me sounds like an organ, a pipe organ or something. That's guitar? It's just guitar, yeah. With, with weird pedals. Lots of pedals. And, yeah. and, and so Steve's Eurorack is generative. It makes noise, right? Lots of synthesized. I'm into that as well with pedals that also are looping and recording and playing things back and sampling itself. So right. it ends up being a kind of mixture of, okay, there's a, an interesting no choice there that I didn't even hear actually. Yeah. I haven't heard that since I heard there. that from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been meaning to talk to you about that. Okay. We'll have to, we'll talk to, yeah. go, go uh, far later. I'm just, just gonna, to, like, this is an extended section of about 12 minutes of this sound looping from the guitar. So that's Sam's guitar. Probably, I was probably playing OP-1 or something at that time. Yeah, but that's not the OP-1 track. Right? No, I know, yeah, but yeah, I'm no, saying... You were doing I, other I was, things, right. I was looping things on guitar to go then play synth and piano or... Or there's a, something called a Critter Guitari um, Collider Loop that I played as well. Right. Which is a different synthesizer. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. But um, can you go to like a, maybe the, just a fuzz moment? Yeah. So there's some really wonderful. Oh, fuzz I played with a bow, a bow as well. Guitar yeah. With a bow. So maybe um, is that this section here? Well, oh, that's, that's some actual that. normal guitar. If you wanted to hear normal guitar. Yeah. Yeah. We'll play a little of that. Oh, that's not that's, too normal. That's not normal. <laughs> Even that's not normal, but sounds good. It's, it's fairly pretty, normal. It's for pretty me. cool. With this really weird effect. It's a thermal face mask. So I guess what I was thinking is this the bow? Yeah. Oh no. Uh, this is more. That's, a pick. that's real guitar. How about mm -hmm. this? There's a couple sections where you get really loud on guitar. That's not one either. Uh, well, we definitely have the end. Let it rip, Sam. in number nine, which I believe is part of here. That's a violin bow on the guitar. Talk about 
about this section too later, but just to tell you that one thing that Sam and Kevin were doing, which is really good, is my thing's pretty much in A minor, but by shifting where the bass is, there, where you can create these other progressions right. that work against A minor really well. So this was a section that ended up being in C major. Yeah, we were calling out chords to each yeah, other. Yeah, like so it's really cool. All right, so let's talk about the OP1. The OP1 is a kind of a boutique synth. It makes sounds like this, which I call twinkly. And what is this you said? There was like some sort of bouncing ball the, uh, algorithm? Tabla, tabla. tabla um, sequencer. So I, what chord is that? It's A minor or F. Yeah, A minor or ninth Yeah, some kind of A minor nine that I played into it. And then it generates the notes pseudo random in this tabla um, and they bounce off each other. Um, and it just kind of has this evolving um, sequence. Yeah. And then we, it changed. I played drums at one point on it. There's, there's, yeah. I played play bass on it. There's all um, kinds of good things coming from that. It's like this big. Have you seen that? It's a little, little white synth Yeah. Let's see what this is. That's the bass. It's the bass part. Come on. All right. You can Love buy it. that, Sean. You can buy that. So yeah. that, he was doing that while the, the acoustic bass is playing a high solo. This might be just noise that we didn't I think we, end up and using. That would be a good example of something we mute, probably. Yeah. Yeah, we got a moment of that. Um, what do we got here? More of that. Sort of a lower pitch version. Of yeah, music. exactly. All right, and so at one point, Sam uh, trots out a little kick and snare. Played live, not sequenced, not quantized. Spoiler, uh, we did move a couple. Yeah, we moved a couple of those things. I think we may have moved the snare drum by two beats throughout. Uh, all right, so more twinkly stuff. So yeah, that's kind of what you're doing from the LP1. Yep. Pad sort of sounds. And then, um, so tell us about the Collider Loop. The Collider Loop is a box about this big, little blue sampler. I, I can go grab it, but um, it has an SD card, so it, um, I can loop as a microphone I, and a direct out, so I can make loops in real time. And I did actually sample your piano. And, and the bass too. And the bass, so I sampled the bass and then I'm able to reverse, um, it. reverse it and, and change the speed of it as well. Uh, yeah, let's we find out. We'll do that later. Check. Let's but it also, has, it. it also has samples stored in it. Yeah. So there's a part where my friend Danielle, she has a very prominent moment on the record. Yes. Just because, uh, she was in on the SD card, like so. Um, is that this? So you can scroll through the samples as well. It's actually it's a very pr primitive synth, but so that's somebody talking. That's like rain or something. Yeah. Let's just see. Here. Okay. All that's right. The well, piano. We'll, yeah, that's the piano. That part's great. Um, piano is in six. Uh, Love of My Life is eight, so I think it would be here. Maybe a little before. That's the sample of the bass. That's the bass. You are right, sir. So that's seven, so... Uh, yeah, it's a sample. Anyway, it's not, anyway it's not, there's, there's cool stuff in here. It's kind of so. not that exciting on its own, but I find that that kind of texture stuff, right. along with the other things happening... That's a really interesting glitchy layer that we, you know, worked in soft, but it's in there, in the mix. What do we have over And again, we would, we would add contrast by bringing it in, fading it right. in, taking it back out. Right. Um, so there's a moment, and I'll just go to, because I can find this. Um, there's a piano moment. Ah, I see your problem. There's a piano moment, and you will find that piano moment maybe here. <coughs> now this does have some echo on it, and let me kill that. He said, not killing it. Uh, that's the wrong track. Must be this. That's the headphone. So that's what the piano sounds like. That's 
it's not a bad piano sound. And again, the bass lick is just not that much, but. So there's a lick coming up. It's playing uh, F and E with an A on top. Next lick. That's what you recorded. Oh yeah, is it? Is that is the exact there? moment you recorded. Because if you, I worked it out. Is when you play the Kaleido loop. Huh. So you got. So this is really interesting intro. So who knows what that is? Changing the speeds. We left that in. And um, so he's just looping that behind the Arco bass solo. Real secret is have Kevin Farrell, that is an amazing upright bass player. Oh, have, have Kevin Farrell play over your weird sounds right. and then all of a sudden you're a genius. Yeah, I'll play it. Anyway, so there's that. Um, a whole bunch of just really weird, glitchy, kind of fun sounds. Um, there's more of that, and that looks to be the same. And then I have this. Nice. So where is the love of my life? It's got to be here somewhere. That's that's a bass solo that you yeah. grabbed and reversed. I have no idea. Reverse everything. Reverse everything. <laughs> I think that's your friend Daniel. There it is. Yeah, there it is, yeah. So. Take it down, I think. Love of my life. Love of my life. I'm live doing changing the speed and right. playback of this. So that's not like it's a love of my life is like a very short sample that's being manipulated, you know, by the by, right. the, by the playback. I'm and and then at that speed it just becomes a texture <clears> in the mix. Yeah. Um, so here's the piano, first time it enters. Um, here it comes. Maybe, there we go. All right. So I'm trying to do both melodic stuff and also some chordal texture stuff in there, and that's what it sounded like. We got another theme. We could use a tuning. <laughs> yeah, probably. All right, so a little bit of that. And all this is bass leakage. So the piano doesn't really play until next year, I think. And just some background. So did you, what did you do in those moments when the piano wasn't playing? In the mix, or sure, yeah. yeah. So we just muted that track, right? That's just bringing in when we when muted those regions, so we just didn't have that extra right. Leakage. And you hear how much low end from the bass is leaking in. So we had to do a fair amount of high pass filtering on this track to make it usable. And you'll you'll get to hear that in a moment. Um, but just I think it's helpful to 
know what these tracks are. So that's all leakage. Something going on here. That's oh, just more leakage. You can hear the um, car there even. But Sam did jump over. I get some. double scale. Yeah, double I, scale. You know, so if I get paid more. Right. And then uh, at the end. Right. There's more piano. And uh, I started to sing. Ah, piano has this great felt mode, with the middle pedal, which puts a piece of felt on the strings, completely changes the sound of the piano, makes it really dark. There's no highs on this, which makes it great for texture as well. Uh, and a little bit later, I start singing along, and I'll save that for the other tracks. All right, the Urak, you've heard a little. Let's go and let's just go right to here, I guess. So there are some effects tracked on this because my system has a very primitive mixer. I've got a uh, unit in there that can be either reverb or delay. So in this part, it's reverb. There's a section in the middle where I switch over to delay. And um, I have four voices. So one of them is called sine, and it's a sine wave. That's the high voice. There's also a sub out that plays exactly the same thing an octave below, or it can play a perfect fifth above the main out, or a combination of the two. The, they're being triggered differently, so it's almost like the low voice is kind of accenting what the high voice is playing. And the other thing that's really weird about sine wave is, you guys have studied, I think, uh, the equal loudness contours. Do you remember that from audio? Like these different contours in the graph showing the equal loudness of frequencies? Well, because the sign has no overtones, it varies quite a bit from below middle C to above middle C. So you're almost hearing it as like there's a high melody and then there's background parts below it. Now there's also a bell sound that's starting to come in here that's much more reverberated. But so it's interesting, just listening to this as much as I have, that there are sections where I hear uh, an accompaniment part and a melody part, and they're both looping, but it's actually one loop just in different octaves that's giving that impression. Um, so there seems to be a lot of back and forth but it's really just all one, one sequence. And at some point, and I think that was about here, I started applying an envelope to this because I hadn't set that up before. And you can hear the notes are a little shorter. It's not just one continuous stream of pitch. So I have a decay envelope. It just does a decay. It's got an instant attack. I can set the decay time on it. So I'm making it very short and staccato here. So you're hearing three things, a high sign, a low sign, and a bell. Late in the game, I brought in a string instrument and um, it was completely out of tune. So this is me attempting in real time to tune it to the other sense. So eventually I just turn the melodic range down to zero. And I'm trying to tune this thing up. And it's starting to get there, close. And at this point, I have the bell sound actually being manipulated by the sequencer to change 
different tones like wooden bars, metal bars, glass bars. Um, so it's doing some really interesting things tonally. Anyway, it's pretty much unusable. Well, we, we did but, choose, and, I think, a couple moments. Yeah, and then, and so what we ended up doing was fading that retuning section out, and where it comes back in, bringing in this new sound. And the new sound is a pluck sound. And that's, um, it's a physical model of a, of a stringed instrument. It could be guitar or mandolin, harpsichord, harp. Um, and it's really loud compared to everything else. And it's just, I screwed up, you know. But yeah, that gives you a little flavor of that. The other thing I can do with my Eurac, and I wonder if I can find a section like this. Um, I can change the length. Well, you know what, we'll just point it out when I hear it. But I do that a lot where I'll be in a groove for a while and it will get very hypnotic. And then um, I just kind of mix it up by switching, you know, doing three note sequences, two note sequences, six note sequences, 12 notes, you know. 32, and so these create different things, and particularly when you start using non-binary numbers like six, five, three, um, it works against the rhythm, and so that's often where things fall apart, and we start a new section. <laughs> so uh, you'll hear that. Anyway, but that's kind of what it was. You can see there's a lot of stuff there that sometimes the musical sections and the um, the pads are not lining up, so I might have, I forget what we did in this case, but it wouldn't surprise me at all that we decided to mute that because we'd already heard that section, and so to create a contrast, we killed it in the next section, that sort of thing. So, anyway, that's a little bit of that process. I will save this, uh, I will not save this, I will just exit it. But let's go to a a middle mix, and I think about N is where I started to do this. So let's go with O. So one of the things I did, um, and we'll see that in one second, but I want to just pull this out because you might find this interesting. I did a lot of note taking, and this is what you do as a producer is just endlessly listen to this thing and just make as many notes as possible. So here are some mix notes from N. Uh, we'll get to all that. I'm going to just put it on automatic. Hopefully that'll work. And let me go to preview while that's loading in. Um, so these are sort of general notes and you can see now I'm starting to have working titles for the different sections of the song and timings of where I might put in markers. Um, but even this is not the level of depth that I was doing. So let's find those, let's see, uh, Qlis, equipment, metadata, old audio, images, Reaper, session info, exports might be in here. No, nope, that's later. Um, uh, Premaster, this is our, ah, well, let's, we can look at this. I think this will have what I'm looking for. Maybe not. Uh, no, it's just the timings of markers. Um, Sam, what do I do with it? Yeah, I don't know. Images? No, it's not there. Uh, it may be that it's just in a different, folder. We said that was not it. Um, maybe it's in the session folder with info in there. Uh, oh, it's unusual. So I will have to find it. Um, it may be that. Well, that's just that. Uh, I don't think it's in the metadata folder, no. Uh, all right, well, I'm not going to waste time on this, but I will dig it up and... Um, you can describe what you did, though, you... Yeah. So what I did is I just listed, I listened to every track. I noted where every entrance came in, you know, every significant 
new section. Um, and then um, went through and, and just made timings and notes about everything. Uh, I'm sure it's on the other drive, uh, but apparently didn't make it to this backup. So uh, I am going to go up one, unless it's here somewhere. I know. I would think it would be here, but that's not all of them. Well, I've, I've these other lists too. So there, oh, that's, that's more what I was thinking yeah. of anyway. So yeah. Um, so you can see this is on a much more granular label and I've uh, basis and I've color coded the different sources. So Sam's guitar is orange, and the bass is blue, and going section by section with what really needs to get the focus. Um, what are the things we should be listening to? And that changes. And you can see it. Sometimes it's the Eurorack, sometimes it's the bass, sometimes guitar, sometimes piano. Um, and it can change quite a bit. So I then went through, and that's what I think I'll be able to show you next is on this beautiful session. Sorry, do we have more stuff? That's just the audio? That's the one audio file? Uh, sorry, no, there's more tracks. Where are you? I'm just at the bottom of the list. Is that it? There we go. So I went and took every place where I thought things should be featured, and I color-coded them red. And so you can see there's a lot of back and forth, right? So uh, in the primordial soup, bass is really what gets the focus. Well, the very first few bars are just sort of the soup. Then it's the bass. Then there's a moment where the bass kind of steps back and the, the guitars come in. And then there's a Eurorack moment and then back to the bass. And then on the next section, a um, little Eurorack followed by piano then back to the bass, and back and forth, and sometimes piano lead has it, sometimes the bass has the lead, sometimes it's Sam, uh, sometimes it's the OP1. So I went through and just kind of went section by section, and you can see all the thinking that went into that. Um, at this point, I had all this section in one place, but let me just go back one. Yeah, there's some sort of solo bass. There's, um, there's bass that is playing the rhythm and being supportive, and then there's a couple of licks. I'll show you that section. And we ended up breaking that off into its own thing. And I got to this section, and I realized it was much better without Eurorack. So I took the Eurorack out. I'm not shy. And there's a, that other section I mentioned before where retuning during the bass solo, um, we brought this out as well. So the gray part is out. Um, so, and it also, I think, created a necessary sort of ending. You can kind of think of the story as having three acts. First act is kind of setting the stage. Second act is, you know, like in a film, act two of a film is the main part of the film, the longest part. And then act three is kind of where you hit the climax, and then everything starts unraveling. So anyway, um, that was a big part of this. And one of the things I'm big on using is clip view. And this is probably before I actually changed the, the clip volume. But um, this became the basis of bringing up and down tracks and doing some of that clip view um, editing of audio so that we get some different Stuff. All right, should we get to the good stuff? Yeah. Let's get to the good stuff. So I'm going to go. Questions? To... How are we doing? Yeah. Please chime in. Um, so let's play the beginning again, a few minutes of that, and then we'll skip around. So we heard the raw. Uh, think about the focus, how it shifts in now with a, with a mix, where, where the focus is different, and hopefully. Better. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you can, um, <clears throat> well, I don't know, for some reason the Eurorack is all red here. That makes no sense. Because uh, we committed it. Yeah, oh, that's what it was, right, yeah. Because at this point we um, 
had decided we liked what was going on in the Iraq, but at some point it needed to come down and up. Um, and so you can see we have one big long Eurorack track that it has some, some level changes in a couple spots. Um, but otherwise the red is indicating where those focus points are. So let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. Fade in. Even the bass is fading, I think. And by the way, this is what I mean by the soup. The Eurex in there, but it's not really prominent. It's part of the texture. Much more sense of depth now, right? right? A little feature for Sam here. You're playing the melody. So nothing happens in the primordial soup. Do you know what the reference of the title is? Primordial soup? It's like the earth before there was life kind of thing. Mm. It's like just a mix of lava. <laughs> Bringing the guitar up here, or the wobbly organ, sorry. And what do we got on that bass? We've got an arc compressor. So everything has stuff in the individual tracks, but we're also submixing. And I should explain this too. So if you look at the bass tracks, whoops, I don't know what I just did. I, I just hit the tab, I did nothing important. But pretty different than the Raws, right? Right. I mean, it's funny, I, I had never even heard the Raws till today, for yeah. months. And I'm hearing a huge you know, difference. In, in... So that's a nice sound, right? And. It's a stereo track here, but it was actually tracked in mono. We had one mono track for the mic and a second mono track for the direct. What I did was I put them all on stereo tracks so I could do all the editing to both tracks together, right? And if I want to move a clip from like the solo to the main part or, you know, move the arco to their own track as opposed to the pizzicato, I could move things easily, right? So on the tracks, in the first four, uh, or tracks uh, two th three through six, they're all stereo. But then they route to two mono uh, aux returns here, the bass mic and the bass direct. And I've got a little bit of EQ and um, some different uh, stuff going on there. Um, and you can see they're not even in level, right? The bass mic is much more prominent. So if I were to solo just the mic, it's got a little compression on the master channel. And if I were to, sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing here. Um, uh, I'm not gonna be able to do this, right? Because I have to solo safe the bass main track. But anyway, um, at one point during the solo, that, that balance is going to change, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, let's move on to section two here. So that begins at the end of this. So 
So the bass riff is changed in section two, which has a new title now, Looking for the One. I gotta say, if I can brag, I really love how that piano sounds. We should um, piano. So, Good yeah, question. what did I do? So first of all, kill, right, kill the low end, right? So here is an expander gate. That's to help, putting that first in the chain to help bring the bass down when the piano's not playing, right? Um, and to fade out the bass a little bit. And there's a release of four seconds on that. So it's very slow to do that when it closes. All right, that was that. We got a seven band EQ. That's the EQ on the piano track. So getting rid of all of the bass below 500, basically, or 400, I think it's that too. Uh, a little bit of dip around 4K where the piano was a little piercing. Was the piano open? Yeah. Yeah, because it was mic'd. Um, and the mic is facing the bass. So let's just hear a little of that, hold on one sec. Yeah, let me mark you right up to there. Let's play. So if I take a moment to kill the effects, let's just kill everything. So that's the raw track. Uh, we can put the gate back in. Now let's put the EQ in. Oh, interesting. Are we not? Hold on. Um, which one is it? Is it timeline on. follows, insertion follows playback. I want to turn that off. So. That's the raw piano sound, and admittedly, soloed, it sounds a little more natural. But that works so much better in the mix. And that's actually a pretty cool uh, sound called calming piano or calm piano that's um, used a lot in ambient music. So we tried various kinds of compression without. With. So that's bringing some of the warmth that the EQ is taking out. It's in parallel too, if you know. That's mixed in parallel, right? So it actually, it looks like right. you're doing a lot of compression, but it's probably about 60, 75% wet. Right. So you're still getting those transients through, but you're getting the benefit of some of that uh, Absolutely. compression blended in. We've Excellent talked about point. Yeah. parallel compression. And then um, Soothe. I love this thing. Oh, yeah. So right now. You guys ever heard of this? <laughs> I think every class we open this plug. <laughs> right, let's hear it with it. I think we, we added this towards the end, and yeah. I remember it's not doing there, a ton, but it's not doing a ton. I think there's a few moments. It might have been even when I'm, either we were playing later in the song, but there were some sharper upper frequencies. Yeah, and you know. I know where they are too. If we I go, I bet that I bet that that goes a little right, a little more there. Yeah, so that's um. And I remember just being like, I love the piano sound, it's just the piano is a little harsh right. in some of these upper frequencies. Oh, we got to roll on. Right here. Yeah. Now I've done it. Where is this? There you go. So that's working a lot harder there. Yeah. Still subtle, but... Yeah. Very helpful. Well, where's our where's our recall notes? Uh, we'd have to open the original session. I think honestly, we we had no, we had no expectations for this to even be an album. I'm telling you. Yeah. So when I set this the session up, I think I just used ISA. It's just like plugged everything in. Good choice I, for piano. Yeah, yeah, it's a great choice. Yeah. But but also it it just it it uh, reiterates that this was like for fun. This was like totally right. Um, I think everything was ISA and just 
we did, there was no engineer. There was no one sitting here. Right. So I, I, that's why you do hear the door close a couple times when I go back and forth. But um, I don't think we used a single outboard anything. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'd have to look at the original session. I'm sure I wrote in the comments. So it wasn't just a plug-in based album. Plug-in based album. What do you, no, everything was live, but... No, um, I'm talking about when mixing. Oh, when mixing, yeah. 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 Oh, we're mixing As in opposed the box. to, I think we've had conversations like when I'm the engineer hired for something. Right. If I was engineering this, now that I know what it is, we would do some things differently, and I probably would throw some EQ and compression on the piano on the way in if I was just engineering it. Yep. But because I was playing, my head was honestly more in, the, in that mm -hmm. zone. Mm-hmm. That's why it's important to hire an engineer. We probably should have had somebody here doing yeah, it. Yeah, it's turned but, out okay. But it turned yeah, out okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So, I, so think, I think all of it was just ISAs. Yeah, you know? so we have two uh, spatial effects on this. So let's throw this one on. Ooh, nice. And it's just a super uh, long verb. Do you don't mind me Oh, he just said it. What was it? The verb? That. Vintage. Vintage. <laughs> That might be the stock setting. I don't know that I changed anything. That's beautiful if it is. Yeah, that's it. Uh, with a little bit of one band in front of it, just to get rid of lows. So to condition the reverb. Clean up, clean up your reverb. Yeah, for sure. Clean, clean up, clean up your reverb. And uh, yeah, you don't need you don't need 60 hertz reverberating. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I did was I used a fairly long delay, but because the tempo is exactly 140, we can go and set up the echo again with a, a little pre high pass filter. Um, and actually, Echo Boy does this as well. But this is a quarter note dotted at 140. So equivalent to three eighth notes in length. And this combination It's just da 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 so as it echoes, it gets farther away every time. Pretty cool. That's that's sexiful right there. Right there, though. Yeah, that's a technical term. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what's going on with the piano. Now, that's the lead part, and we want that to be nice and clear. But then I'm also doing these other parts where I don't want it clear. I want it background, and I want it hidden and opaque and murky and right now this is probably the felt on there too this is no highs no percussive attack on the hammers same echo but more same reverb but more I'm just playing single note, but because of the echo, it's getting this really floaty effect. You want to play with the click, boy. No, but I'm listening to the Eurac, and so that's effectively There's no click, but we were playing to, to yeah. a tightly timed right. sequence. What was the, if you know, what was the time of the sequence? Well, it was 140. It was 140? Yeah. Now, sometimes you'll hear Kevin or Sam or I really think of that as 70, like a slow, Half time, 70, half time, half time right? right? And then my clock becomes sixteenth notes at that tempo. But, but to be honest, it, it's mostly I in the bass. Yeah, well, in the bass, but also, you just you just kind of feel it. You feel the tempo. You play to it. It wasn't, uh, you know, you hear the difference in sound, right? Much more hammer. And those are EQ'd and level differences. Right, for they're that. completely different same, channels. Right. All from the same source track, but this is the beauty of spreading this out over yes, different channels. I can think of the role musically differently. 
That's your contrast. Right. On, your, on the mix, mix aesthetic, that's your contrast. Now on this third repeat, I've set it back into the texture, even though it is the melody. And then we get this more texture, random, kind of floaty, not just sort of melody stuff to keep it interesting. And um, and where this sits in the mix when on the texture track is just background. It's filling out the background space. I see you just had a moment. I did. That's the basis moment. And I, I would still consider the Euro rack level very low in this first two songs. So let's get a little louder in the third section. So that's a good place to, to note that the piano is red, the guitar, the back of the piano, then up to the bass. The twinkles. One. Twinkles. Twinkles. So shifting the focus of what's supposed to be the lead. Does that make sense? Did you hear what we did with those twinkles? I'm pretty proud of that moment, actually. You want those twinkles. So that's the piano, ending the piano. We have a little break between the piano and the bass solo. Kind of bring it up and down. Could you move the clips? Oh, just color. Uh, just the color. Yeah. Yeah. If you double click the color for the track. Right. You can option click or command command click. Whoa! Don't do that. Hey, we'll remix. Yeah, that's not what I meant. Uh, is it just uh, it clips in tracks? Yeah. yeah. I clicked on the track. Like up by the by the name. Up by oh the track. Yeah. No, I don't want to change the track color. Though. No, I know. There's a way to... That's where you do That's where I do it. Yeah. Here, I'll be... Sorry, I'm articulating them poorly, but... Yes, it's probably Just uh, double-click that. Clicks in track. Ah, there you go. And right, you that's what we do. To, to whatever you want. Right. There may be another way. I, that's how I do it. Right, I mean, everything started out with one tr color for the whole track, but... You know, this... Being able to go red and say, hey, look at this. And so I'm really thinking of it like a film director. It's like, what do I want the audience to see? Yeah. Right? Okay, you saw that? Now look here. Twinkly bits. Now look here. Here's the piano. And really trying to direct the attention of the listener. So. You know, for those of you that want to work in like film score, that's kind of yeah. just leans into that world. I just want to focus a little on the Eurac here for one second. So here is pretty much had the same sequence going for eight minutes. Now I'm changing it up. Three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so I'm changing the lengths, just kind of mix it up. Now I've found a new thing. So the, the deal with my sequencer is it can be completely random or I can spin the knob and lock it into 16 steps or whatever step length. But I can also put it in the middle somewhere so it will randomly change notes over time. live large Sam so what's going on here so the blue is the main base and then Kevin started playing these really cool licks so I separated them off and so they get a little less reverb a little louder a little more focus it's a pretty subtle effect
And if I um, solo the bass, which I should be able to do, right? Where is that? There's more reverb on the, the lick. It's pretty dry here. It's a smaller space. So that kind of lingers over into the next repetition, right, with the reverb tail. Is that cool? Alright, Seth? So What's up? I'm just thinking about how you got two tracks, two different tracks. So you edited each note out? I just separated regions, dragged them up, and holding shift. Or actually, Sam taught me a cool shortcut using P and semicolon, is it? That lets me move a clip then, up or down. And then that's just consolidated now as a file. Right. That's why. So it was, it was individual slices that big, and then I just fixed it into one big thing. So it's silent in between, right? But again, contra contrast, right? So you could do, do that to vocals. Yep. Hey, it's all like, so wait, how did they? Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, that's all it is. And you can see where the, the red clip is happening, there's a straight line on the blue clip. So I just consolidated them both. Just Yeah, so this, is mute. this was muted here. Right. Well, it was empty. Right. And then after consolidation, it, it filled with zero. So right now, Kevin's pedaling on the five of the key of A minor. She's so playing E. And... So for the next section, he switches to A. So we made this a new song boundary. So the last one was called uh, That Brass Ring, as in going for the brass ring. This is called Holding Pattern. And he's just gonna do this for forever. I don't know how he does it. I get bored with stuff. But he just, he's able to play six minutes of that. Foundational. Yeah, very no, foundational. It's, it's great. So, uh, there's that. And let's set them all back to small. Yeah, so ignore the Eurac color because it's It's a slow build here. The sound on the bass is a little bit thumpier. It's really got quite a bit of lows to it. And the bass is one of the few tracks we're not really doing much to the um, low end. Where's that bass? Yeah, we're cutting below 70 hertz. With a pretty steep cut. Uh, but I, I think it's, I'm curious about that now. Yeah, he's playing well above that, so. And I may have automated the frequency on that. Alright, so this goes on. This is one of the more hypnotic sections. Uh, you were really vibing? You are vibing? We got a little... Uh, yeah, so after Sam's like... You don't like it? You know, you gotta hear this. So he, he, Sam's always building stuff up. <laughs> and then just like... Let it die. <laughs> let it die. I've cut the mains. Um, sine wave out of the ear rack. So you're hearing some of the sparser parts. Oh, but Kevin's doing the same thing, but it's right. It's kind of a, almost a kick drum, right? It's like, oh, he's really driving yeah, this. Yeah. And I brought the sign back in.
What the hell is that sound? It's amazing. I love that. It's a, it's a Chase Bliss yeah. habit with the Chase Bliss uh, generation loss. I put the fuzz distorted guitars in their own track just so I could EQ them a little differently. We have also, when Sam is really playing lead as recognizably guitar, that's got its own track. And then we have this sort of drone texture track. So there's the pipe organ type sound. Do we add any other effects to the guitar? Yeah. It's funny. I don't know. Um, so if you see some things bypassed, it's probably meaning they're automated and they're brought in for a certain section. Mm -hmm. It's got the ubiquitous uh, 6dB roll-off below 100. We got, looks like a little notch around 1K. Well, I'm curious to... I don't think that's playing right now. Yeah, maybe it's not. Oh, right. So, duh. Um, we're on this track, so again, another notch, same EQ, just copied. Oh, I remember what this is. So, if I were to look at the Euro Rack, we can do this, because we like you guys. Um, I'm gonna pull up, uh, and I believe it's in sound field. We'll pull up Paz Analyzer. So, this is on the Eurorack, and you can see that Eurorack kind of operates in a particular frequency spectrum. Let's go back to kind of where we were. And we're kind of, Eurorack's kind of operating between, say, 125 and maybe 800. Uh, you can sometimes see higher harmonics coming from the bell sound, but a lot of that is really low. And where are you, Mr. Urak? You're this guy. So what I did on the guitar, to bring it back to where we were, and that is this guitar. Uh, is it this guitar? That guitar. It is this guitar, right? So this guitar, um, if I unbypass it, I've got a, a notch here to make room, and this is not only in this track, but a whole bunch of the sort of droney tracks, cutting out that range to allow the Euro rack to project in that range without really having a huge effect on the other tracks. Um, so it looks like a pretty drastic EQ cut, 7.5 dB at 1,000, or center around 1,000, but that's what's making the Eurorack sing. If you listen to the mix for that Euro, yeah, there's a hole there. But Euro's filling that hole. So it's about making the Eurorack project better, is to cut in that range. What else, Sam? What else do we do? Um, uh, close. Um, we can talk about Pan Man. We got Pan Man. Greatest. I love it. So that is doing a stereo pan, very slow. And you see how the panning on that track is, and the guitars generally are on the left side of the mix. But we also have an OP1. And we have the blue. So the OP1 is kind of here, and the blue collider looper is over on that side, all doing this texture stuff. Um, the blue, the OP1 is staying put, but the blue is also doing a similar pan man, but so it's kind of very slowly moving between the center and the right side while the guitar is doing that on the other side. And they're not necessarily in sync. You may think, oh, Pan Man, I don't, I don't need that, but I use Pan Man on oh, most pop great. productions for my, my delays. I always right. have the delays moving a little bit. 
on your like on your vocals, your delay throws and stuff, it can add a lot of contrast. So you and may it's think, at the end of the chain too. So yeah, like any right. effects that we have in yeah. there are also part of that. But steal that for a pop yeah, production or, that's or a great. hip hop or whatever other instrumental production. And what do we have? We have our long verb on that, the vintage verb, but we're also using a chorus effect. Is that on? That's on five and six. Is it? Yes. Docky for points are not labeled. No, I have it. Oh, not labeling the bus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I can look over there. But yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Dock me. Not all 100. percent Dock me. I'm a dock. And what is? And uh, that's on the. Uh, is that or is that on the oh, it's a slap, slap that we use later. That's okay. on the. Um, it's on the blue, and it is also on the guitar and the LP1. So they're all getting a little bit of chorus. I don't know. You know, it's part of the. I stole that value from. Uh, oh, Sam's not here. I stole that from Sam. They, they, they use that for yeah. all the time. Uh, we use the Brigade, uh, UAD, if you want to show which chorus we use. Um, oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. And it's based off the Roland um, CE1, I believe. Uh, yeah, whatever it was. I remember that pedal. What is it? I remember that yeah. one. And uh, really great chorus. Yeah. And um, super, super that exact like 80s kind of chorus vibe, but... When it works, it works great. You'll know immediately if you like it, like on something. I'm not so fussy about these plugins, to be honest. <laughs> if it works, I'll know if it's working or it's I not. I am fussy. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, well I, actually, you can see there's like a, a hilarious amount of like stock and also like really boutique. Right, right. And, but it's and, working. That's the most important. And that's the thing. I know when I, it's working for me and when it's not. And I'm, you know, if it's working, then I'm okay with it. But and we took things off and we tried right. other things. We I remember on the Absolutely. I think on the on the Eurac we yeah. had like about ten different compressor yeah. arrangements. So maybe that's an exaggeration, but but um, four or five isn't absolutely yeah. 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 Like things were not working, and then we ended up on this mix with uh, this guy, which we'll talk about when we get to that a magic session. And by the way, you're not seeing everything that was on the Eurac because we consolidated the whole track with effects um, before oh, it this is there mix. In active scene. Oh yeah. If you scroll, if you go to your mix window, down here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of those. If you want to see what plugins were on. There, Got it. Just to see. Right. So what do we have? We had originally. Uh, well, that's not even here. Abbey Road. Uh, that's the same as what we use on the bass. Right. We got this one. Well, everything's inactive. Uh, yeah. So EQ seven, RC comp, uh, the MV two, which I love, and then that was going to. Um, the reverb, the room, and uh, the seven is the slap. You didn't know Come Down Room inspired parts of this, did you? I did know that, actually. You did know that? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the Bucket Brigade, cause, uh, well, I think actually I showed this to, to Matt, yeah, yeah. and you guys use it a lot, though, right? We but use it, it on, I think, oh, Bucket Brigade. But in turn, when, Matt, when I showed it to Matt, I kind of fell back in love with it, too. Yeah. So it's good. It's very good, right? It's very nice. Um, so come down room, play the room. Yeah. Um, and just for you other effects, so I've already told you about the vintage verb. That's our super long reverb. But um, for the OP1 drums and for other stuff, I wanted a small room that was bright. You can see this is only a 0.83. Um, and so that just kind of adds a little puff of ambience without really stepping on any buddy's toes. Um, the Echo Boy we looked at already, the super long uh, quarter note dotted Echo, the Brigade we saw, but we have another Echo Boy that is a slap, and that's just fixed at 150 milliseconds, and that's used in Love of My Life Yeah. on the might, vocal sample. Might be, and, yeah, I might have got another track, might have gone there. Oh, the but, Euro Echo's there yeah, too. Yeah, probably, right. And then yeah, uh, used it first in the Euro right, actually. And then we have a uh, D verb, and what was that? For Adele. Yeah, a little small room. I think that was on Euro Act too, in a particularly dry section. Um, so that's all we're doing effect wise. So where were we? We we're just talking about the guitar, and um, on the OP one again with that. Um, this thing, Mondo Mod. It's a Waves plugin. I've used this before. Um, just kind of crazy, uh, weird like stuff. Flanger, right? we should, we yeah, like a, we should, a, a we should play it. Shouldn't we play that? We should play it. We should play, we should play oh, it. So let's find a section where there is 
In fact, uh, oh, some twinkly stuff. Excellent. So let me uh, solo the twinkle. And here's without. Oh, wait, it's subtle. But what this is kind of modulation and panning. So remember how we had the pan man on the other two tracks of droney stuff? This is doing the same thing, but it is um, uh, doing panning and modulation at the same time. So it's making the OP1 move between half left and half right. So it seems like, like almost every instrument has things on it to kind of make it move and live. Right. And Whether particularly, that be a delay or a pan or a chorus. And particularly important for drones. Yeah. Because drones can be very static if they're just making the same sound all the time. And so that's an opportunity for you to do, get a little wilder with the spatial aspects of it. Because the sound's not changing. So why not make it move a little bit? And when we eventually do an, uh, a surround sound mix or an immersive mix, go even farther than that. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, are you ever worried about like with the spatial aspects of your tracks moving and stuff like that? Are you ever worried about them colliding? Or um, that's a great question. So we've partly dealt with that by kind of tilting the collider loop there, the OP1 here, and the guitar drones over here. So yeah, they might kind of intersect, but they're occupying sort of different spaces, right? Um, and there was a point in Love of My Life where um, the Eurorack and the vocal were kind of spread a little too far and we brought them in to the center for that section because the mix was feeling a little unbalanced. Generally, we didn't have to worry about it. And at the level these drones are at, I'm not too concerned because they're just not that prominent in the mix where they're gonna eat up a lot of space. But yeah, it's a great, great idea. I guess the answer is we sort of, we thought about it in the way we structured the panning. It's a good moment to say, say hi to Professor Kevin Farrell here hey, in the room. Hey, come on the, in. Uh, the anchor, the anchor of the record. Uh, oh, and it's, it's really, for 30 seconds. it's really so, great that you're here because um, one of the, one of the issues that I had with this mix, um, <laughs> I mentioned there were two parts of the, the piece where I faded out the Eurorack. And I just stumbled upon this, really, as I had the Eurorack muted, and I heard what Sam was doing with the textures, and I heard Kevin's beautiful solo. I was like, why would I want to put Eurorack on this? This is so cool and ambient and floaty that this deserves its own moment. So let me play you the entirety of this section here. We'll crank it. And I have a question for Professor Farrell too. Yeah. While he's here for the 30, oh, 30 let me let me do it without soloing things though. It'll work much better that way. Whoops! Now I've done it. Okay. <laughs> so that's bringing in the reverse piano that we talked about earlier. things bypassed that shouldn't be bypassed. Uh, we'll work it all out. Yeah, I wouldn't save this. Yeah, I'm not gonna yeah, yeah. save it so we don't mess it up. And it's a copy. Of it. it does not sound as ambient as I recall, though. Oh, DSP mode is on. That's that's wrong. Tell me about that. Just go ahead and hit option and the DSP lightning bolt. Okay. Right Help here. me out. Of these guys. While that's doing that, Kevin, can you can you speak on your your listening? How do you make? <laughs> how, can, how how did you? Uh, I mean, Professor Ward and I are, are had the fun job of you know. Should we just reload the session? No. Without typing. It'll be there. You go. Um, okay. you, we had the fun job of playing with a lot of these effects and and. Uh, Okay, sorry, the opposite has to happen. One more, one more time. There we go. 
in a lot of ways, uh, Kevin, you're the, you're the anchor, right? But that make a lot of these these decisions we're making, I feel like, really work musically, right? Can you speak on like that process in your head and, and, and just for ten seconds? Yeah. Not the spot, but like. Um, well, there's no drums, right? So I'm a bass player, so mm -hmm. most of the time I'm locking in the drums. The closest thing to the drums were sequencer. Professor Ward's the sequencer. So I was really, I was really trying to lock in with what he was doing, as if it was like a live drummer, basically. And you were also, you know, what he was. One thing I love about his approach to modular is it's very spontaneous. <coughs> it's not like setting something in motion and backing away. It was very much reacting. We were constantly and dialogue, at, mm -hmm. at least rhythmically, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of that came from that. Um, there were also times when Sam was actually conducting certain ideas, certain chord changes from his guitar, mm -hmm. and showing me places that he wanted to go. Like literally, like we were playing together long enough yeah, to where yeah. we speak a common language as far as like where, yeah. I, like I, know, I know where he wants to go. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Which is spe really special, and I, I hope you have that. With people because it's really beautiful to, to and it's it. listening and i'm uh, yeah. as i'm doing my thing and twiddling my knobs i'm <laughs> hearing like the chords change and so now i'm saying oh let me instead of you know c e f and a let me throw a d and a b in there to reflect this uh, harmonic shift that's going on yeah, yeah. so i'm able to react to what they're doing and modify as well yeah just listening and like I think we're, we're all friends and we know yeah. each other and you know and I also think um, a part of the I don't know if people play improvised music very often is but I think there's something about that we respect each other so that if, if Steve takes it in a place or if Sam takes it in a place I'm gonna trust them and go with them it's like yeah actually right. I think I trust that where he's going is somewhere cool mm -hmm. and I'm gonna honor those those ideas that are being proposed in real time. And I hope, I think, sometimes that happens for me. I get to yeah. that. Absolutely. Well, I hope so, too. And, and there were several moments where you just, and this is one of them, where you just stepped into a lead role. And it was totally great. And we let you run with that. And, uh, no, that's that's part yeah, of the... Yeah, there's moments when you're play. the kick drum, rock solid, doom, 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 and there's moments where you're so, so right? right? Uh, you know, um, so let's hear one of those moments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, this is the end. There's that really weird low sound that became a perfect transition to this. So there's a new idea in the Yurak. So we have the Kaleida loop doing this reverse piano. We've got the guitar looping this continuous layer. And into that comes the Arco bass. Sam's doing the synth bass. Which I knew I could do at that moment because Kevin, Professor Farrell, was Hi. playing the melody there. So I was like, okay. And you, can you hear the clicks? So I'm playing the synth. You could hear that in the room because there's some room mics on the bass. We tried to get as much of that as we could, actually, but. I need some. I mean, it's just like the same. Oh yeah, well it sounds, just, it sounds as if I think intentionally it was I was going for more of a like a mo like deep sub thing. But yeah, I don't think that that's dissimilar to to a to a piano just comes in still. Very lyrical. Yeah. A little bit of 
echo and uh, reverb on that. So, you know, and this is my rehearsed solo. Like, this is like, you know, you're just kind of creative. which I'm very excited about. Yeah. Um, but when we recorded this, I didn't know we were going to put this out. <laughs> like, we were just playing. <laughs> like, yeah. We were just hanging yeah. out and playing. Yeah. So, I think I may have been far more bold than yeah. I would have been if I just knew. Uh, you did good. <laughs> I'm glad if, you were if you well. me, like we were making a record, I'd be like, like right. <laughs> probably a little bit more careful. So maybe there's something about well, there you go. But I want to just appreciate y'all listening. Show you one thing here before Kevin goes. So, Kevin, tell him about the windmill. Oh, the windmill. <laughs> the windmill is a. It's a very. Um, there's something in in um, I guess acoustic instruments called extended techniques. That kind of just like little kind of deep cut sounds that have become part of the vocabulary. Uh, the windmill is. Um, a technique that one of my teachers, this guy Mark Dresser, taught me back on the West Coast. And it's this way of, um, normally on a string instrument, the, the idea to get the purest sound is to draw the bow across the string as, it, as straight of a line as possible. Like without moving up or down on the runways, but really pulling it as straight as possible. And if you actually kind of deviate from a straight line, you get these weird imperfections or these weird deviations that kind of like starts getting a little scratchy, the intonation, Almost right. like some wow and flutter a little bit. Like, like you're a 10-year-old uh, playing the thing. Exactly, right. So <laughs> the most pure sound really comes from drawing the bow completely straight and relaxing your hand. So I had this teacher who had this other technique that was like the opposite of that, where literally he was drawing the bow in a circular pattern <laughs> on the string, and he called it windshield wipers because it literally sounds uh, like the windshield wipers on a uh, bus. Okay. <laughs> right. I heard that it's a windmill for some reason, but... But from that idea, if you look over to those two blue master tracks, the basement pan center throughout the mix. So it just kind of wanders all over the place. And it's just these spooky little sounds. It's just nuts what you're doing there. Oh, thank you. So let's hear that um, in context so you can hear the panning on the bass. Normally panning a bass is something I'd never do. Right. But this is not a supportive fundamental kind of bass playing. This is textural. Thank 
Interest, right? A little something that we did to add some interest to the mix. Move the bass around like a maniac. Return. Yeah. And yes, and when the fade up is complete, the uh, Eurac becomes really the central instrument in this section. Right? Spooky. It's total Halloween stuff right there. I want to also say um, it was really awesome watching Steve work on this. Um, I just think the just watching, getting to watch another producer work and watching, we don't often get that opportunity. We tend to work in isolation. So really watching your process and how meticulous your time coding of events and the intention that you put behind all these gestures, um, almost in the way that a, a classical composer is intentional about the notes that are put on paper. Every little, almost uh, like writing a letter with a pen. <laughs> like every letter was, or directing a film. was very important. Yeah. And um, I learned a lot from that. I, um, cool. it, it made me go back to my own mixes and really kind of like rethink some of the smaller things. That all really add up. I'm gonna mention one little thing while I think of it. We just heard the blue box. And Sam does his thing where he dials in new sounds, loads them in from memory, and then tunes the pitch of it. Yeah. And so what we did on that uh, gesture is that's dry. A little pre-sound. That's the bass. That's dry. <laughs> that was their sample of bass. And then it gets reverberant again. Okay, cool. So just, and the purpose of that, by making it dry, it makes it just poke out of the mix a little. Right, let's hear that in context. Probably get going back to my yeah, you probably should. You have it's another it's class, right? Thanks, guys. Don't forget uh, to it. Back to it. Yo, congratulations in advance. This is for you. This oh, it's is, for me. This is from the uh, wow. music theory department. Wow. wow. <laughs> oh, Those wow. are the superior pop tarts. Oh, well, I'll, we'll have to talk about that. I think, uh, I think brown sugar or cinnamon is better. But... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Beggars can't be choosing. If you don't want them, I'll take them. They're number yeah. two. Yeah, yeah. They're number two. Yeah. I'll share some. I'll share yeah. some. We'll get through this and we'll share some. Yeah. Anyway, just, uh, and you'll hear this in different places too, where I've just gone bone dry on the, uh, the Collide Loop. And it gets more texture and back to the bass. So anyway, lots of fun stuff there. We've got more of this sort of stuff here. You've kind of heard a little of this. Love of my life. Coming up in five, four, three, two, one. Dry again. Love of my life. And now with the slap echo. bring you to um, the happy medium. So we've both basically been mostly in A minor. In this section here, Sam really starts pushing us to move to some different yeah. stuff. So yeah, so first kind of like F major seven, which is a flat six chord, and then a G chord. Which is a flat seven chord, and then to the flat three chord, which is the relative major chord. So here we are in A minor. And Kevin's following along? Yeah, I mean, this is where you know, Kevin's a master, so.
Right about here, it starts to change. So there's that flat six, F major seven, which my sequence totally works with because I'm playing the notes of that chord. Now we're back to A minor. Now back to F. Back to A minor. So it's cool for me, I don't have to change anything. Yeah. You're just moving around me. And now here's the G. You hear how it's like a different texture and it kind of pushes against what I'm doing. Back to F. I'm bowling here, right? Yeah. And now we're in C. Back to C, back to F. Let's go to G. And so here's where I was saying before, I'm, now I'm changing some notes. I'm adding in D and B and taking away, uh, I think it's C. And now we are C major chord. It's really the, quite different from where we've been, harmonically. Oh, Texture change there. Everything drops out, so the twinkle kind of emerges. All right, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit in the interest of time. So we end up on a nice big fat C major chord. So we call this section the happy medium. It's a happy. It's going to change back to minor very abruptly. Right here. All right, so a little flavor there. Uh, Kevin mentioned some advanced techniques, extended techniques on the bass. And there's one I just love that he does here. And it reminded me of the sound of a panting dog. So we call this piece, I Love Dogs. Oh yeah, the other cool, really wicked cool thing about this is what Sam's doing. Tell me about this pedal again, Sam. The Chase Bliss, Chase Bliss Theremin. It's an analog echo, but it's tuned um, to, in this case, it's tuned to an octave above and, no, two, one octave above and two octaves above. So the repeats, and then it goes, I think it goes below as well. Right, when it shifts. It's so I think it just jumps up an octave, but then when it jumps back, it, right. it, that's it lowers the original. So, right. So while stuff is in memory, in the delay, if you change the delay time, 
then it's gonna, when it drops, it's gonna lengthen them. And because it's a two to one ratio, you either get a note that jumps up an octave or a note that jumps down an octave. Well, what's interesting about this pedal is analog, so you can actually do that with the speed of a, of a delay, but they figured out a way to harness it exactly to, right. like in key with your, yeah, with your so music, which is pretty wild. What a freaky effect, so we tried to feature that. It's my favorite guitar part. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's pretty a little squeak. Like you can play a chord, ow! <laughs> you know. I say ow a lot. Yeah, it's great. Uh, what do we have going on here? Yeah, there it is. Right, so it's either jumping up an octave or down. Oh yeah. Listen to what the Eurac is doing here. So normally we've been counting um, 16 steps. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Makes two bars, right? Listen to the length changing. Four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight beats. Now it's changing. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops, let's go to that section there. And it just creates some interesting counter rhythms. Where is it? I'm going to loop the end of that. There we go. Do that for a while, and at the end of the four bars, back to the 16. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, two. So you're able to kind of create a little syncopation with the sequence. But it also could mean it could totally throw off where one is, and you gotta add an extra well, beat. Because at that moment, too, I'm trying to not, I'm not playing right. on the ones either. Right. My Holy Ghost game. So Sam gets really grainy here. And so we ended up doing a little filtering and fading it out where it got obnoxious. Sorry, Sam. Hey, it's okay. It's all worse. And it also ended really abruptly, so. Right. Doing a fade kind of hides well, I think that. It's a good example of uh, something was happening and um, that I wasn't loving. Right. In the pedal board, but it's live. You go for it, you figure out a way right. to, to make it work. And muting it made more space for the bass and the euro to have a moment together. So it's all a win win. And you switched over to OP1 drums. While we're on the subject, OP1, no, not mute, so uh, a lot, of fun. Um, lot going on there. So let's just bypass that. Now the CLA7 is bypassed, but uh, what do we got here? Make sure we're at the right part. Let me mute this as well. So that's what it sounds like. Got a seven band. Taking a little edge off that snare. The snare was a little bright for my taste. The CLA was bypassed, but we use this. Do you guys know this plugin? I love this plugin. It is both upward and downward comp compression. So we'll take the lightest things and compress them down. We'll take the softest things and using parallel compression, bring them up. 
So instead of having these swings on a whole basis, you can kind of bring the top and bottom closer together. And this, it, this was a kind of fake stereo, but this was a stereo input from the Open One. Right. So the kick and snare on the same track. It actually spent a lot of time making them work together. I wasn't loving how the... Uh, yeah. I forget it was the kick or snare. I think it was the... Uh, yeah, I wanted more from the kick, I think. I can't remember. What, but, the, what the hell was this thing for? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for that. A little thump. Multi-band distortion, actually, but we're only using it in the low end um, because, again, I wanted, I was just missing some of that, some of that low end. Right. So we took out some, with the EQ, we did high-pass filter out some of the bass, but this kind of restores some of that sense. It was more sub-lows, too. Yeah. Know, but. Um, so that's that. And then well, We would have eventually, if it wasn't working, we'd just move the kick and snare to different tracks if we had to, but we made it work. And that's coming into this room too, which is just a D-verb. Small room too. Uh, stock, I don't think we even changed the settings. It just sounds, does what it, I know what it does, right? It. it worked. So um, to hear that in context, let me end solo. And let me play it without the EQ on second. You hear how like present and forward that snare is? But with the EQ, whoops. Yeah, sorry. It puts a little more in the background. The um, shaker is from the Eurorack. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's what's going on here. Probably getting a little bit of uh, quarter note uh, bass from the Eurac as well. Quarter note kick. This goes on forever um, and is also one of those pieces that just kind of, it's always sounding like it's going somewhere and it doesn't really go anywhere and then it finally gets somewhere. So it's. A really brilliant bass like So it's F, E, A, F, E, low A. And so again, kind of, is it an A minor? Is it an F major seven? We don't know, it's a little ambiguous. It's both, it's none, it's neither. It's everything all at once, all the time. The drone from the LP1, the twinkly. Again, playing with the sequence length. Suddenly we feel we've arrived somewhere, back in A minor. Go back to the bass riff. So Kevin's making this whole record, honestly. <laughs> you know, there's a meme out now that's like, the, a chord isn't a chord until the bass player plays this note, a tr supposedly attributed to Sting. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. It's like, what the bass player plays can really affect how something oh, yeah. sounds, right? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. And so when he decides to sit on A minor, then we're in A minor. Right here. I call this one preparing to land, so we just landed. Yeah, that's you. Me, right? Yeah. But you play what I would have played, man. It's a beautiful thing. Not as well. You're an actual piano. Yeah. I'm not. No, I really like what you played on this. Yeah, so 
section 12 in yellow is a one place sans on piano. So I'm going to bring the bass and change the bass balance a little to bring up more of the pickup. And it makes it just come out of the mix more. Maybe slightly artificially, but I think it worked. Right, it's much more forward than the mix. And it's just in the two pizzicato solos that I do that. I remember I'm trying to retune my fourth voice and I'm getting this metallic weirdness in the background. So I finally take the melodic range and turn it all the way down so I can have just one note to tune everything to. Right here. And <laughs> play this amazing bass riff right afterwards. That's when you're turning it down to tune it. Yeah, oh, to tune wow. it. Oh, interesting. And so now I'm tuning. And he heard it as a riff. Right. Wow. Right. And wow. I'm tuning. And now Kevin's just doing a solo. So the Eurex now muted in the mix, but it was there originally. So drone from Sam's guitar. Bring in. It's like the pachinko machine. It's glitchy arcade yeah. game. The VHS. Yeah. Title, yeah. It's from the LP1. You guys know Strawberry Fields Forever by the Beatles? So at the end of the song, the song fades out, and then it fades back in, and it's just like this weird psychedelic stuff at the end. And the reason they faded out is because they completely lost time on the drum part, and so it fades in the exact spot where they lost time, and then they faded that back in once they picked up the time again. So. Same idea here. I'm tuning, I'm making just this racket. When the racket's over, bring the Euro rack back in. But this idea that you can fade stuff out to hide it. really been struggling with the Euro rack. And um, the problem was whenever the bell or this pluck sound came in, they were really loud compared to the sine wave stuff. And I wasn't getting the sense of a sequence going on and this rhythm of 16 notes in a cycle. I was just getting the percussive parts of this really jumping out. And I'll play you a little bit of that by bypassing Mr. Pro, whatever you call yourself. Um, and let's go to right here, and you'll hear what I mean. So that low sine wave part, it's just not projecting in the mix. So it's almost like I'm just getting the one part. So it occurred to me that we could use um, 
the fab filter here. And the, what the fab filter is, is a um, multiband compressor, uh, the Pro MB multiband, and do nothing below the threshold, the purple. Just leave it where it is. No compression. But above one kilohertz or 1.2, whatever it is, where we're getting the extra harmonics of the bell and the pluck, but we're not getting them from the sine wave because the sine wave has no harmonics, we're compressing that. And we're doing pretty significant compression. So take a look at this section again. And so that's compressing as much as about 10 and a half, 11, DB. And it's really helping and making it more rhythmic, uh, especially as it gets a little busier. Meanwhile, Farrell on his beautiful Arco Solo. Finishes the solo. We're just kind of cooking along. Reminded me of a train. Making good time in space. And this is really where the multiband is helping quite a bit. If I bypass it, much steadier rhythmically. So there's that. Back at the piano, I pretty much locked the synth. We're gonna go all hypnotic now. Just keep repeating the loop. Some noises, pedals, chair pops. So these red tracks above the piano, that's me singing and it's brought from the piano track. I'm just singing to the piano mics.
and they'll get progressively louder as it goes along. Every time we're slicing up, there's a ton of crossfading. You gotta, if you're swapping from one track to another, you gotta do cross. Yeah, we missed a few, we, we caught them. Yeah, we caught them. We caught a couple. And then, you know, when you just have a clip, like some of these piano licks, I'm just fading them out at the end. Super reverberant. Didn't know Professor Ward was the lead singer, did you? That's right. Doing my best uh, Delphonics impression. Piano. Oh, sorry. Wrong thing. So it's bass leakage there. track a little more forward. I gotta tell you, it's fun listening to this in the car at night. Great job, Rick. Crickets. Thank you. 
A uh, bored electric guitar with like fuzz and then just a hard mute at the end, yeah. Sells you. So the way my mixer is set up, I'm using three buses, left, right, and effects. And I'm fading out the error rack slowly on the left and right. But the effects are still there. So it's like getting farther away from you. And eventually I'll fade the effect out as well. That's all pure reverb right now. And we just like looked at each other and <laughs> busted out laughing. Oh. That was such a pleasant surprise. So that's, uh, that gives you a little taste of it. Um, I don't know if Sam will tell you this, but I'm a huge fan of the one band EQ, high pass filter on pretty much everything except the bass. Money. That's, I just wanna, you know. Right? Yeah, that's, that's something different. But yeah. drop? I don't know when it drops. That's a good question. We don't know exactly when it drops. Uh, we are, I think we'll do some samples actually. You laugh, but yeah. Yeah. Can I sample it? Can you sample it? Parts of it? We, you cleared my samples. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we sampled, we cleared it. Well, there's three writers, so we have to get permission yeah. from, uh, it depends on what you're sampling, of course. What do you want to sample? What part? Just some Eurax stuff really well. Eurax, and like, that's a, that's like a once, question for you. Right? Whole parts of I got an idea. Why don't you ask, um, uh, your friend that plays Eurorack, maybe yeah. maybe he'll perform on something. You know what I would what I would do is I could totally give you uh, a different performance. I don't know if I want to give you um, stuff from the actual record, but yeah, I could set well, up but the that's same what I mean. scale. Like you, could, and, you bring in your Eurorack every yeah, once in a while. You can do that, especially like if you that's, have that's something. That's my second request to sample the Eurorack. So well, but you want it. What if the, what if it's not in A minor or F? Right. Like what if you want it? To you be tell the me key? the key. Or the chord, and I'll, I'm happy to. You want that it buzz? I'll give it to you. Just different, whatever. Yeah. Chord, tell me what chord. But for you, it is That's 250. Right. Yeah. It is. <laughs> per note. Per chord. Per chord. Per chord. Well, yeah. There's only 12 chords, really, so. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what else? Thank you so much for sharing this. I mean, I know My it's, pleasure. And it's I, not like every album. This is no, a, no, this is a very, very weird stuff. And, very different. And but for, I think it lives in a film score world. Definitely. And for me, you know, it really was a matter of kind of uh, like an onion peeling away the layers and what what is the shape of this thing i mean the biggest part of this honestly was deciding on the form like how do we create different sections of this and and very intentionally if you look at some of the drone tracks you'll see like um this drone begins at the beginning of that section right um let me zoom out to the whole thing here one sec um so we got this drone, that ends on section three, but that drone continues. Um, this one's in on section four. This one's section five. You start to carve away at it. Right, right? and you, yeah, uh... so making different combinations of drones. 10 and 11 have no drones, you know. Um, we bring in drones here in the second half of that one. Um, so, so it, and oftentimes those drones are beginning and ending on session boundaries, like here's a little guitar drone at the beginning of nine, and then it's OP1, and then when section nine ends, that's that. You know, so we're creating kind of some different textural things for each different part to make them distinct. There's some, some incredible musical moments in this, which, you know, I think are, I've almost got it memorized. Are the ambient records like mostly all live? I think generally not, actually. I, I don't, I can't speak for, I can only speak for the ones that I know of, but I can't, I actually can't really think of many. A lot of them are generative, right? which is a different thing. Do, do you know what I mean by that, or no? Yeah, and like, even when I'm doing on guitars and what you're doing, it, 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 you can kind of almost let it play itself, but that's not really true. Right. Um, but. Yeah, I, like I, a lot of the Eno stuff is generative. Right. Like he would work with tape loops. Um, his first music for airports album, he had um, different s sounds like choir or piano 
on different tape loops and he would run like seven different tape loops at once. But because the loops were all of different lengths, the timings were kind of more random and um, really fascinating, unpredictable sounds, yeah. but it's all spacious. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if I would entirely call this ambient. Yeah. I mean, I, that's what we set out to do, but it's much more driving and much more yeah. tempo based, yeah. um, which, you know, aside from that first bass solo, um, where it does really kind of go ambient. I a lot think. of ambient music that I know of too is like, it's like one person. This is, right. you know, different people in a room. But yeah. Was, did you, yeah. Could we, um, is it possible for you, Sam, um, you and Bell, the director, have an awesome drum? We, yeah. We're, we're actually, <laughs> we're talking about doing more and, and I, we wanted, we didn't know what this would sound like, obviously, but I do hear a version of this with, with like, um, we're talking with the drummer, like, I have a drummer, yeah. and then maybe Paul Carlin to do some sweet, yeah. sweet, um, some sweet sex. I would love to work with a, a poet, a, a, someone that could do some spoken word. I'm, so, I'm serious. Let's do it. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, it's not it. I know, I know Kessler wants to really, was, wants to jam, he wasn't around that day. Right. But, so there and, and even the next thing of this, and I think we, we would do another session, mm -hmm. might be more individual pieces and might be more planned pieces. <laughs> and I think, the, there's, I think the moment, too, a lot of people gravitated towards where there was actual drums. Yeah. And I, I, I can see a version of that, like, like more four-on-the-floor dance-oriented versions of some of this stuff, too. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's... It was nothing. It was literally we just knew, all knew each other, and we we I know your music. You you know what my guitar sounds like. We know Kevin is a is a monster, but uh, we didn't know what it would sound like together. And it, it, it's interesting to say the least. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I think I think the the musicality that each of us brought to it is really what makes it work as a cohesive work. It's just you know, I mean, I I thought I knew Kevin. I thought I knew you, <laughs> but when actually hearing what you guys brought to this because yeah. i mean i have uh, other videos posted on youtube there's just the Eurac, just doing that same kind of the exact same thing i posted one literally two nights before the session mm. that was just the Eurac piece and it was cool and interesting and after about 10 minutes you get bored but what was so great for me as uh, someone who's been exploring that Eurac space just to see, oh, it actually does work in an ensemble setting. Mm -hmm. And it actually can be interactive with other musicians. And I can respond to what they're doing as well as them responding to what I was doing. And just to see how beautifully it, it worked. And, you know, yeah. I mean, definitely the Eurac is the heartbeat of this record. It, even though you might not hear it in the mix in certain parts, it is running continuously from start to stop. And so we're all trying to sync with that and, mm -hmm. and keep that going. But um, to hear how it just it has evolved. I'm actually, in a way, terrified to have to do anything again because yeah, right. Because it was so ran not random, but it was so of its moment. And like, I mean, there's moments where I'm like, I don't know how I could recreate that guitar. <laughs> you know, uh, we did analog mastering. Did an analog mastering chain. We used the uh, the crane song. Which we've talked about, right? The, the green and silver, and we went into the curve bender, and we did a little bit of just a little bit of high end. I have the recalls. Um, we went into the API twenty five hundred, just just not even a dB of compression, just a little bit of compression, and uh, and then we did a little bit more with plugins, and uh, I pushed it too hard, too loud. Yeah, that's <laughs> so the way we, it goes. And then, so we backed it back down. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of this is iterative, right? It has to, you have to do it, and then, uh, oh, that's too much, or that's not enough. It's also or, very dynamic. It doesn't have right. to be as loud as a pop record. It's supposed to be dynamic. Right. All right, um, if that makes sense. You know, just to take you back to a little of this. Oh, that's, uh, sorry.
you know. So that's what I had to pick apart and shape. It's a lot more of just like <laughs> everything in your face, which is cool, right. but it's just kind of just like everything. Right. And, you know, thinking back to this idea of balance and contrast, right? Is that me? Yeah. Um, I'm still making that sound. Crazy. Um, so, yeah. So how do you put the balance and the contrast in and really give it shape? So yeah. there you go. Can we thank Professor Ward for coming thank in and hanging out? Thank you. Thank and thanks you. for your patience. I yeah. know it's not, uh, you know, I don't know if you're into this kind of music, but, uh, you know. I'm, uh, I appreciate you. I'm, you guys are my test audience. It's the, you're the first ones really hearing the mix. And, and that's not even the master. Can we just play a little of the master? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, tell us what we did. Oh, you've got to get up? Uh, you have to find it. It's, uh, well, it's in the... Uh, Let's find it. It's in the uh, pre-master folder. Uh, no, it's not because it's in the Linux. Oh, there, the master. No, no, it's not. No, I, I have it here, okay. and it's in the this file. And here is the limited version that's been CD'd. This is the actual master. Um, we'll skip ahead. A little brighter. A little more dynamically controlled, a little, little less dynamic, which is going to happen as you, as you crank up volume. It's a little brighter. It's too soft. And add a little bit of analog soft clipping, or is that digital? I'm trying to remember if I left it in. I had to look at my notes if we left it in or not. But we we experimented with the prism limiters that are in the rack too, and we used the tape saturation actually on the grand song. But then for final limiting, we did do uh, fab filter. Um, but very very little. We didn't want to over you know change. Change it too much. Though we did three or four passes of mastering, so that yep. that was a pretty big part of it too. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's well, there you story. go. Well, that's it. Thank you. I'm going to email you about uh, this midterm. I'm going to figure out what we're doing. If we're going to, I'm going to decide. Uh, yeah, you can stop it. Thank you. Thanks, Zaire, for running that. <laughs>